Welcome to the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. In my many years as an animator and director, my most defining projects have been my short film, Layers, along with Vanishing Ink and Cirque de Solitude, two books which I wrote, illustrated, and pitched at several studios as feature films. And I have more of these feature film pitches coming soon. For a long-time watcher of this show, I imagine you're probably a little bit sick of that intro by now, and I have a little bit to add to it. So right now I have a publisher considering one of those feature film pitches slash book. And then another one, which is a musical fantasy, is actually I have a studio on board. I'm not saying who it is quite yet, but they're on board to help me produce and finance this new project that is a musical fantasy. It's, it's very exciting, and I can't wait to share more about that. And then I have another five pitches that I'm going to be releasing this year as well. So just, just to make things fun and, and to have more future projects available. Today our guest is Jeff Bell. Jeff Bell is a producer. You may have known his work in such titles as Nine, it was the number nine, uh, and then Hoodwinked 2, Ozzy, and Next Gen that was on Netflix. And he has, is the owner of the company Tangent Animation, which was working on, was it when you were working on Next Gen that you, that you realized what? like you were tired of the problems that you were encountering in the animation pipeline, so you created a software called Lupe. Is that how you pronounce it? Is Lupe? Uh, it's, it's actually called Lupe. It's basically uh, modeled after a jeweler's loop. Uh, so the idea being that you take a closer look at the, the work that you're, you're, uh, you're doing. So, uh, yeah, um, the production software is basically it, every studio I've worked in, uh, pretty much every studio that does uh, that kind of work ends up building all these production uh, software uh, uh, pipeline and workflow and asset management, project management softwares. And it yeah. seemed like we were continuously building the same thing over and over again. So we saw kind of a need in the market for us to take the work that we were doing internally at Tangent uh, Animation at Tangent Studios and actually release it to the public for uh, external usage. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as we've, I've talked about with your team, I was involved with Nimble Collective early on as right. they were starting to build a, a cloud-based software where you could be on the cloud and running the software on the cloud. You wouldn't even need your computing uh, power from your your computer to to run the software, which is amazing, and yeah. I developed layers my short film with that, and then they were purchased by which I couldn't say for a long time, but Amazon Web Services, yeah. and uh, now that's now that's out, and your services also with Amazon Web Services. So how closely tied are you with what Nimble has done, and and what differentiates differentiates you from that? Uh, we're currently not tied that very close, but uh, okay. we've actually talked to them because uh, now that they're with Amazon, they're actually a resource for us as a partner okay. of uh, AWS, the AWS Web Services. Okay. And in, there's an interesting tie-in to myself and Nimble as well, because Corbin Gossett, uh, Jason Schleifer, yes. used to work with me back in the 90s at oh. uh, Alias Waypoint when we were working on my app. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love Jason. He's awesome. <laughs> he... Uh, He's actually one that uh, anytime I send Nimble Collective an update on what I'm working on, he's he's one of the first ones to respond, and he's just a really really supportive guy. I really, yeah, really think yeah. he's great. So super helpful, super nice. Yeah. Well, awesome. So I I think that this because I am a director, right? I have projects that I want to do. Uh, eventually, I would like to be able to direct a film on the cloud where you could live anywhere in the world and you could be working on a very high quality film. I just think that that's the future of, of animation, and I, I'm really excited about being part of that. So uh, let's pretend like this is a sales pitch, and you sure. are selling me as a director on using your tool. Um, just go. Go ahead, and I'll, I'll ask sure. any questions I have, and, and we'll just uh, play it by ear. I'd also like to ask you a little bit after that about the process of financing and, and doing everything. Independent mm -hmm. films are really challenging, so we'll yeah. go on to that topic after that. So. Sure. Uh, so, you know, as a... As an individual, if you're an artist uh, or an aspiring director, you have your own story and you want to get moving, essentially what Loop gives you is you get a one-month free trial. Uh, it gives you X amount of storage uh, it, uh, and uh, uh, database storage, uh, file storage, and uh, uh, ingress and egress for your data. Uh, it gives mm -hmm. you basically a pro project management. It gives you asset management. It gives you review tools, and it gives you render management all in one package. Okay. Uh, at an indie level, it's $15 a month. So yeah. the indie basically allows yourself and five others to collaborate uh, at $15 each per month uh, okay. in order to basically get your, the idea being that 
At that point, you get your short up and running. And as you get funded, you can expand it to a full studio. Uh, gotcha. And you're essentially using uh, pretty much the same uh, underpinnings as, uh, as uh, Tangent Studios uses for our productions in Toronto. Great. Awesome. There was a, a word you, you said that you get something regress. It was EG. Oh, it's basically the data, you know, sending data and retrieving data from the cloud. Uh, so there's oh, a okay. certain amount of, of, of uh, uh, ingress, which is sending it to Amazon and then egress, which is bringing it back out of Amazon. Okay, great. Um, so your t- it sounds like your tool is useful like for a team of five people who aren't all in the same room together. Right. They, can, they can host their short on the cloud. Mm-hmm. And uh, are, you, are you familiar with Artella? As uh, well, no. Artella was created by the. I went to Animation Mentor, the online animation school. And oh, they yeah. have a, a similar platform. They were building. Nimble was bu- building a similar platform, and then you've built a similar similar platform. Mm-hmm. What makes yours? What differentiates yours from from the others? Well, there's a. So one thing that we try to do is we also want to make sure that if uh, a pre-existing studio that has on-premise hardware already wants mm-hmm. to basically take on a uh, loop as their underpinnings for their uh, uh, um, uh, pipeline software, that we allow the use of their on-premise hardware for rendering, for storage. Basically, the filers then act as a cache for the data that would be mm. sitting at Amazon uh, so that you're not constantly pulling the data in from Amazon if it's already local. Uh, okay. So that allows basically remote people that aren't within the facility to access the data from Amazon it allows artists within a studio to access the data from the filer. And if it doesn't exist, it goes and gets it, refreshes the data on the local filer, and then sends it to the workstation. Oh, uh, wow. So we also allow for uh, rendering locally. Uh, so mm-hmm. if you have a render farm internally already, you can certainly do that. But because the data lives in AWS, you can also fire up uh, EC2 instances to do your renders in the cloud on, on AWS at any point in time. Oh, that's great. So it's kind of that hybrid of uh, on-prem versus cloud. You can go completely cloud if you want to, but we yeah. also want to support local uh, infrastructure. Is there any way to use both at once, like to be rendering on your yeah, servers absolutely. and on? Yeah. Yeah. So, that's cool. so it gives uh, you more the, added of, render power. That's that's a great benefit. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. So if, you know, if you've got a thousand nodes locally and you want to supplement that with another thousand on uh, AWS, you can certainly do that. The uh, render uh, software that we use is actually AWS ThinkBox's deadline, uh, mm-hmm. which allows for uh, managing jobs locally and also in the cloud. Awesome. That's mm-hmm. great. That's great. And you're using it for your own productions? Yes. Sounds yep. like. So you used it on NextGen. And are you working on a? Yeah, we're working on another project uh, uh, with Netflix. It's a Jorge Gutierrez uh, yeah, project. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, so that one's that one's quite fun. It's coming along really, really nicely. It looks great. So, um, yeah, and then we have a few others that I can't talk about right now. So. Right. Yeah, <laughs> we we always have a few things we can't talk about, yeah. right? <laughs> Which is good. It's good to have things in the pipe. Um, yeah. And it, what what more can you tell us about the George Gutierrez or Jorge? It's Jorge Gutierrez. Uh, I, I'm a, I'm a little bit concerned about like saying too much because I don't oh, want yeah, to say, yeah. I, I don't want to say more than than Netflix would have would have uh, uh, sort of put out in the press but there's you know there's tons of information on it yes uh, uh, especially if you follow uh, Jorge's uh, Twitter account for instance. yeah well and if, if the information's out there already we don't really want to go into it we want to go into the nitty-gritty details on how to how to direct <laughs> so right. so in your experience as a producer what are you looking for in a director or a collaborator that you'd want to work with? Uh, some of the best directors I've worked with have, have sort of understood that, uh, you know, unfortunately, there's always a budget on shows. And yes. <laughs> it's, it's incredibly important to understand uh, how best to utilize your budget. Sure. So you really have to determine what's important to you. Uh, so is it is it really important that the crowd characters that are standing 50 feet away from you are completely different when nobody's really going to notice them. And if they yeah. do, then you're probably not doing something right with your primary characters. Or mm-hmm. is this opening to the next sequence more important to you? So, you know, we sort of do the $100 test. You got 100 bucks, where do you want to spend it? Uh, because right. you can't go over that. So, um, $100 and, test. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so directors that, I find directors that do that end up with a much more consistent film. Mm-hmm. Because it, there's nothing worse than having 
say, you know, 10 sequences look stupendous and 20 sequences be below par. Look terrible, it be, yeah. It would be better to have them all level so that you right. don't take the, uh, the audience out of the film. Right. Yes. Yes, it's like the puppeteer in your hands showing now. Mm -hmm. And you can see the hand underneath the puppet. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, you want to yeah. you want to be consistent. You want to you don't want to break the spell. I like that a lot. And and actually, I, I can relate a, a lot to it with this project that I've been working on. Uh, before I even got this studio on board that we're we're talking out all the details and budget and that, all that sort of thing, I was already thinking like, how can I lower the budget but still get a really interesting look? And uh, and where am I willing to sacrifice? You know where on a Pixar or a Disney film or a DreamWorks film, you'd, you'd have all these crowds in the background. Can we do something different? You know? And so that's, that's definitely been on my mind. And I, and I've heard other producers say that um, we talked about Braun. I had yep. uh, Brenda mm -hmm. Gilbert from Braun. She was my second guest on this show. And, and that was one of her big things was a director should have budget in mind. And, yes. you know, that's, I, I think that's really interesting for our audience to hear because, you know, we think, Oh, I'm going to be an artist. I'm going to be, expressing myself although an animated film is a really expensive way to express yourself <laughs> yeah so so really actually animated films should be more about the the audience and you should really really think about the budget for the producer's sake because i mean a good producer is fighting for so many things for the director and the team all the time um, yeah. they need somebody fighting for them as well for sure for sure for sure yeah. um so and you know one of the other things that i find is very very useful is if uh, you know Pretty much every studio I've worked at that uh, has done feature films has this concept of CDBs or could be betters. Uh, oh yes, you, <laughs> you really have to you really have to believe that the producer has your best uh, interest in mind when yeah. they say we need to shelve this for now and move yeah. on because it's really it, it's incredibly interesting how how often when you come back to some of those CDBs later and look yes. at it and you go this is fine, right? But had you attacked it while you were looking at it and wanting those changes at the time, you would have spent uh, money unnecessarily that could have been spent somewhere else and it felt better. So. Right. Yeah. I In the studios I was in, when I was doing animation in the pipeline, I, I heard that all the time. They said, let's just label this as a CBB. Label this mm -hmm. as a CBB. I remember what the first show I worked on was Alvin and the Chipmunks 3. And and uh, they took the shot away from me before I could fix a little thing, which was this little mouth twitch that one of the chipmunks did. And uh, I, I think I saw it. I noticed the mouth twitch when I saw it in the theater, but it's been on my demo reel so long that I don't see it anymore, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> I don't think anybody else sees this little mouth twitch that's on her mouth, you know? Yeah. And I think yeah. they gave tons yeah. of time at, at Rhythm and Hughes to do stuff. For and sure, I, but, I mean, but the budget, budget that, I mean, but the budget's probably supported it. On, on right, well. right. I, I was recently listening to uh, a podcast with Brian McDonald, a good friend of mine who was interviewing Ronnie Del Carmen. And he was talking about when he first got, I think it was Ronnie Del Carmen. Yeah, it was. So when he first got to Disney, he was told that just, just watch, everybody's good at hacky sack. And, and it was because they, they hadn't spent enough time on their shot, but they felt like they were done. So they would go play hacky sack. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and uh, so that actually leads to a really good question, which is something I'm constantly thinking about because I'm going to be doing an independent feature, right? So how, how do we identify those budget sucks? The things that are sucking money out of your budget, you're spending money on this thing and you shouldn't be spending money on it. You could be spending your money better. How do you identify where the budget is being sucked into nothing? Well, <laughs> well in, I mean, some of that is making sure that you have the right uh, supervisors in place to sort of, uh, when you do the breakdowns of the scripts and take a look at uh, where the complexity is going to be, whether it's crowd scenes or it's heavy mm -hmm. visual effects scenes and uh, understanding maybe the technology that you have in house to tackle that and what would be required in order to get what the director wants. Um, mm -hmm. And identifying those things ahead of time, because if you if you just pile straight ahead and run into the brick wall, then then you're going to have trouble. So uh, a lot of that is having the wisdom of the supervisors and ensuring that you don't get into trouble ahead of time. So right, yeah. And I've I've wondered when I'm working at this high level where we there's a big budget in place. I've wondered if it is a benefit or a hindrance for me to think okay, I'm asking this artist to make this change. How does that affect the budget? What, what do you think about that? Uh, well, I, that's really the responsibility of the production team to, to yeah. tell you that. To like do a little bit of pushback and say, well, you're, you're wanting that, but yeah. we've already gone over this shot 20 times 
and one more is going to cost us, you know, this uh, shot. Yeah, of or, or it would be a, maybe a trade off. Uh, yeah. So, you know, sure, you're going to get one more take at this, but we have to take a take away from somewhere else. And right. just balance it out so that uh, you can actually balance the budget out. It comes back to that $100 attempts again. Yeah. I like the idea better of the CBB, though. Mm -hmm. Well, it's you like, have to yeah. be careful because, because some studios call a CBB a can't be bothered. <laughs> so. <laughs> now, now, how do you define it? Can't be bothered. That's... Well, yeah, it's, it's just a, it, it's a joke. I mean, like, that's the way some directors look at uh, a can't a CBB. It's, it's, yeah, you're not telling me that it could be better. You're telling me that you can't be bothered. And, <laughs> you know, a, a good producer and a good production team, that, that's not what it means. So. Okay, good. <laughs> Great. Yeah, we'll try to avoid that as well. That's, that's a yeah. good, <laughs> good point. <laughs> yeah, so. Can, can you explain to me a bit, because you've done this so many times, and, you know, I'm, I'm always admir, admirous, is that the word? <laughs> I'm always admiring the people like you who have done the independent so many times, and consistently the quality goes higher, and, you know, you've just done some great work. What is the process from, you know, got to get the producer on board, got to get the distributor in line, getting the financing? Um, how... how can you talk about how you get financing for a film? Well, a lot of it depends on, on where the film has come from. Um, yeah. Like the Netflix films, for instance, are completely financed by Netflix themselves. Right, yeah. Um, the uh, Next Gen was an interesting one. That, uh, that came about through uh, um, a relationship with the, the art director and the animation director on Nine. Um, okay. They hooked up with uh, a company that eventually became partners in Canyon Studios. Okay. Um, and uh, they were looking, basically looking for a production studio to do it in. So I got a call from Kevin and, you know, Bauzo essentially brought the financing and we did the production. So, oh, yeah. you know, that's, that's basically a relationship. Um, back in the, you know, in the uh, sort of stars days when we did uh, Everyone's Hero at Nine, um, that, that, at that point, basically, again, the funding came from the parent company that was uh, uh, IDT Entertainment and Stars uh, Animation. So uh, the really tough ones are the independent, uh, independently financed shows uh, yeah. because there's always a gap. Uh, you're always looking for places that have uh, enough tax credits to, to get, inject some cash into the production, but mm -hmm. there always ends up being a gap. And that, that, that's the difficult thing to close is trying to find the uh, financiers for, the, for closing those gaps. Yeah, I wish I wish there was a I wish there was a magic wand you could wave to fix it. Oh, oh, I know. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. The the chats I've been having the past couple of weeks have been pretty intense. It's pretty mm -hmm. intense. I can see why not too many people direct an animated film. <laughs> you know, you have to really, really, really want to do this yeah. in order to do it. At the same time, it's it's also valuable. It's valuable sure. to be able to go through this process and and see how it is. Yeah, oh, it, yeah, so. it, it can certainly be tough in it. And, uh, you know, most of these things do take quite a while, too. Um, you know, yeah. A fast turnaround in financing might be 18 months, two years. So Yeah. That's a fast turnaround is 18 months to two years. Yeah. Oh, that's fascinating. Huh. That's actually really good to know, too. Okay, cool. Well, great. <laughs> You're giving me all kinds of uh, great knowledge and wisdom. <laughs> and uh, so... So what do you see for the future of, of your company? What what would be the ideal goal for what you want Tangent Animation and Loop to become? Well, uh, so, you know, my partners, uh, like my partner, Ken Zorniak, uh, continues to sort of push the quality of the animation uh, on the uh, Tangent Animation side. So obviously we want to continue with that. But we also want to look at expanding our, our software breadth and mm -hmm. also helping enable uh, more companies to band together to do uh, collaborative production as well. So that's that's an area that we see as being uh, 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 being ripe for uh, you know helping the industry in general. Um, we also believe in contributing back to the industry, like all the work that we've done with the Blender Institute and the code that we contribute back to the Blender Institute. Some of, some of it, other companies have picked up and actually improved our code, which benefits us as well. So, oh, nice. Um, yeah, so you know, it, we want to keep the bar high in the animation side with tangent animation. And we also want to try to expand the overall uh, animation uh, field. So those are our two goals. Yeah, well, it does seem like the public and the industry is hungrier and hungrier for content. Like, mm -hmm. 
it is a great time to be a content creator where yeah, we can, we can, that. yeah. Yeah. And, and people are wanting something that is extra, extra good. Uh, so that gives us a lot of opportunity to experiment, you know, people mm -hmm. want to just see the same thing over and over and over and over again. So, I mean, uh, both in live action and in animation, you're seeing, uh, you know, feature quality shows showing up on streaming services. Now it's, it's incredible the quality that, that's coming out on some of the streaming services. Yeah, it was amazing with Soul. Soul came out just mm -hmm. yeah, on sure. Disney Plus, and it was Beautiful. incredible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, everybody on LinkedIn in my network was talking about it and how mm -hmm. big of an impact it had. And and I, I think I heard the Bancroft brothers say it was therapy they didn't uh, realize they needed. You know? <laughs> and uh, and so I, I think it's really cool that Disney knows their business model well enough that they know, okay, we can release this thing for free, and it's still going to be a great thing for Disney Plus. Yeah, uh -huh. I, I generate subscribers. I mean, that's really what that's you know, what the service is about. Uh, yeah, have the quality content to get the subscribers on board. So, yeah, and I know that with WandaVision right now, they're actually kind of going back a little bit to the weekly release model, mm -hmm. where WandaVision is being released one episode at a time, and uh, and it's so creating yeah. like a, a bit of a hype and a desire for it, and everybody's talking about like, what's the next episode going to be? You know, I think that's one of those things you could have lost had you not been more strategic with streaming, but they're sure. they're not they're not letting themselves lose it. They're they're still yeah, doing yeah, it, yeah. which is cool. It's cool, and and it kind of happened in a very organic way for me because I was like, why is there only three episodes on here? So I had to go Google it, right? And then Google's like, hey, guess what's going to happen in episode four? You know, it's releasing every Friday, and you know, yeah. it was or, kind or, of cool. Like, or, the, or like the excitement for the Mandalorian release. Like yes, yeah. Yeah, with Mandalorian, they released all at once, didn't they? The whole thing? And then they released uh, I, don't another think, whole... I don't think it was. Uh, okay. Second season? I think, it was, I think it was show by show. Okay, I actually didn't follow that one, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, I'm all into watching classic movies and all, all of this mm. stuff. I've been doing a deep dive into Aesop's fables, and um, I've, been, I've been trying to study the, the stories that stand the test of time. That's been my goal the past couple of years, and cool. it's been a very rewarding goal, but then the trade-off is I go to lunch with all of my entrepreneurial friends who are talking about the new shows they're watching. I'm like, oh, I haven't seen that. <laughs> so WandaVision was because we have to have something to watch while we fold laundry. So, right. so my wife pulled up WandaVision. I was like, oh, this is interesting. So, <laughs> Well, the classics are important too. I mean, like story structure and, and uh, stories themselves. So much to glean from those. Oh, yeah. I was recently reading uh, Alfred Hitchcock's interviews with Francois Truffaut, and those are just filled with gold they are just amazing he the way he thought about filmmaking is very different than what i hear when i hear filmmakers talking nowadays it sounds like they're talking about here was my vision and we did this thing with my vision and you know and alfred hitchcock was always talking about yeah the audience the audience i i, I want the audience to feel this i want the audience to see this right. I, you know it's it was very very different and i you know as much as some people say films are better now i I think there's still a lot to be learned from from those who came before, and and we're solving problems in different ways. For sure. Yeah, especially where it feels like everything has to have huge effects nowadays. And, um, well, I'm that's, finding that, I mean, that's good. That's good. That's good for our industry. But... It is good for our industry. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. I, I though I am finding it is it is difficult for me to come up with an idea that isn't heavy on effects. Mm -hmm. That is a, well, actually a big and, and, challenge. And, and, and certainly not to use effects as a crutch. Uh, you know, if, it, if it's supporting a story point, that's great. But if it's, if it's trying to fix a hole in the story, yeah. that's not so great. Oh, can you, can you give an example of that? Oh, I like that idea. That, that's a... Well, we have this sort of saying, uh, you know, if you can't make it good, make it shiny. If you can't make it shiny, blow it up. That sort of thing. Right? So, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just sort of glossing over holes in the story with uh, some fancy effects that sort of distracts the audience from the from the, the, the problems that exist with the story arc or or whatever's happening in a particular sequence. Yeah. Yeah. You know, make sure your story's good first. Yes. Which is, I mean, it's a challenge in its own. I. Uh... Recently, I mentioned that my book's being considered by a publisher, and I keep getting all these reader notes from readers. And um, one day, it was really challenging because it was like, I don't feel like I'm very good at this story writing thing, and I'm I'm extra worried because I have this feature that 
I, I have to, you know, make sure that the story is great of that. And, and how can I do that? Right. So I went to my friend, Brian McDonald, who consults at Disney Pixar uh, all over the place. He's amazing at articulating the process of writing stories. I was like, do you feel this? He's like, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the art of being a writer. And he told me that the guy who wrote a rebel without a cause was getting an award and thinking in his head, I'm a, I'm an imposter. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and that he got, uh, he got cancer near the end of his life and they were telling him all the treatments he was having to go through. And he said, well, it's better than having to write about it. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> wow. And so, you know, that was, that was comforting to know. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that's probably actually the healthy place to be as a writer is, is not overly confident that you're great realizing that there are some areas where you have weaknesses and bringing on the right team members to, to figure out how it's just like you said, with production management stuff, you know, if you have a good team, yep then hopefully you'll keep each other balanced and make sure and, that- and, and fill gaps and help and help ease over, uh, you know, uh, difficult areas. And things like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah I do have imposter, an app. The imposter syndrome thing seems to be pretty prevalent in the uh, artistic industry. So. <laughs> yep. <laughs> pretty much anybody, like even the, even the people that I think are so great, I'll, I've asked them privately and they, they admit they do have it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's good to know. It really is good to know. Um, an example I do I do actually have on the story point, which was was fun, um, was when I was working on Ellen Three. The director told us that uh, this sequence that I was working on, that uh, the executives were like, "This isn't glamour enough, in, in, glamorous enough," because they had these stars coming down, and so they just like tripled the number of stars coming down from the ceiling, and then it was suddenly more glamorous, you know. <laughs> yeah. Where I think maybe a bit more of a sophisticated way to to do it would be like, okay, let's figure out a different way to introduce the characters. Let's, you know, let's, let's actually create an interesting story moment that here that creates more meaning. And, uh, but rather than to do that, they did add more effects. It, it was the what, strategy. What was the, what was the uh, sort of uh, photography direction or the cinematography like? Uh, Cause I'd also could have played a part as well. Right? You could have played a part in that? No, no. Like the cinematography could, could the, you know, instead of just, again, that's the, uh, you can't make it. Shiny. Well, what we had is we had uh, like three stars coming down with the three chipettes on it. They were just coming down and there were a couple stars in the background and they said, and, and it was just black behind it. So visually, yeah, adding stars was, was kind of the right mode there. Okay. Well, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is good to, to delve yeah. back into the visual effects uh, world for sure. Yeah. So I don't know that that was covering a story problem, but I just I just thought that was funny that that was the solution. Just add more stars, yeah. you know. <laughs> and uh, yeah, the inventor in me wants to come up with something like, well, maybe stars coming down from black ground isn't isn't that great. Let's let's come up with a different idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, but there are also budget constraints, so <laughs> yeah, that was probably the best bang for the budget at that point. Well, and the difficulty becomes too once you get, to, especially in animation, if you get too far down the path. Uh, and you've already spent uh, money and redoing parts of the story is going to be very expensive because uh, you're literally throwing away work. So, yeah, yeah, I can see where, you know, a relatively simplistic solution like that, if it actually affects a, a, a good end result, then why not? Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I'm glad I brought that up, actually, because I was actually thinking it as a weakness, but it sounds like it was actually a strength mm. to, the, to the process. So that's cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for changing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. I guess some people don't like the feeling, but I do <laughs> for sure. So, you know, we're, we're both definitely in, in the independent space. And I actually kind of think that independent is going to, it, it seems like it's a growing part of the industry, which is really exciting to be a part of that. What do you think you people in a role like yours or mine can do to make the industry a better place? Uh, well, so certainly internally, we try to affect change by making sure that we treat artists with respect, treat them mm -hmm. properly. Uh, yeah. You know, we try to be as uh, inclusive as we possibly can uh, just and to create a good working environment. Uh, so, I mean, this is maybe getting away a little bit from the art, but I think it's important to the art because if it's the, very important if, to the art. Absolutely. If the artists are happy and the artists uh, respect the work that are being brought in, then you're going to end up with a better product. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that's super, super important to myself and, and Ken and, and uh, Phyllis, uh, our other partner, uh, as well as our Bounzo partner. It's very, very important that we take care of, you know, we treat them like family as much as we possibly can. 
Uh, and then the other part I think is just, uh, I want to help grow the industry and, and I'm not sure exactly what that means, but we're trying to do it by creating software that allows for uh, collaborative produ uh, production and, and uh, interaction between artists. Um, and if you look at, to give you an example, if you take a look at one of the original uh, marketing videos that came up, for this, it literally is, you start with an idea and then a few people are in a, in a, a coffee shop uh, sort of working together in a coffee shop and then they move to a small shop and then they're in the big studio. That hopefully, uh, you know, we would like to be able to uh, foster that kind of growth by providing uh, tool sets that typically weren't available to the end user before. So. Yeah. I love that. That's a great vision to have. And you did circle back to the artistic mindset too. <laughs> of like, this is how we get the art done. And, mm -hmm. uh, but another, uh, another big part about how we get the art done is what are you feeding into that artist? You know, are yeah. you feeding yourself with garbage? Like, are you, you know, are you being negative and, and throwing um, shade their direction or, or, you know, or, mm -hmm. or not supporting, like, you know, it's really hard as an artist when you, when you take a shot and an animation shot and you think I'm thinking from the animations perspective, but I go into that. And I'm like, okay, I have a vision for this. And I've tried to wrap my head around the director's vision and, but I have something that I can bring to it that's special. Right. And when you put that into it, that is a very hard thing to, uh, to have the, the director criticize it, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and I, I try to always be mindful of that. Like I, I can see what you were trying to bring to this. Let's, let's make it even better. Or, you know. Yeah. I've worked with, you know, I've worked with directors that love happy accidents and, uh, uh, yeah. that, um, you know, that the artist is actually bringing a piece of who they are and what makes them an artist uh, to their right. work. And then, uh, unfortunately, I've worked with some that, that don't appreciate that as well. So, uh, But I, I do find that if the artists uh, feel like they have some input into what's the work that they're doing, try to respect the director's uh, direction and vision, but putting their own uh, artistic soul into what they're doing, you yeah. end up with a better product. Uh, you do. So, and it's about My that mutual time. respect. Yes, 100%. Yeah. 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 And uh, I mean, we're talking about the basic challenge of human communication, though. It, mm -hmm. Also, you know, we, we can see by, you know, the, the politics and the controversies and all of the things that our world has been facing, a lot of it has to do with miscommunication, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a topic that I, I seem to come back to over and over again. Uh, in my own life on this show and and in business and it's it's definitely a worthwhile thing to start to understand and wrap our head around and communication can be difficult because uh you know people communicate in different ways you know some artists are very quiet and, and uh withdrawn others are very outspoken and forward uh and you know i think that's where that's where produ a good production management team comes in to try to make sure that that communication that some of those those issues uh are uh that problems are sort of smoothed over and, and uh, you know, uh, the communication is fostered, so. That's an interesting concept. Can you tell me how, let's say that the director's having a bad day, right? And, and mm -hmm. gives a note badly. Can you tell me how a good production team would help that artist? Well, first uh, they would probably talk to the artist quietly off to the side or it, Probably the animation director or the animation lead for that particular. Uh, that we're talking about we're talking about an animator, for instance, uh, mm -hmm. would probably talk to them on their own. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, as a production team, we would we would talk to the director and, and simply state, like, you know, these people are humans. Uh, you're going to get more out of them if. Uh, and it's not that you have to be. I mean, the work does need to be critiqued. It's that's yeah. part of the process. But there are different ways to critique the, the work being done as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I actually, I'm not, I, I unfortunately can't name names uh, of the person who was such a great example, uh, but I was in a studio where we weren't even allowed to go in the room with a director. Mm. And so the supervising animator would go in with the director and then he would act as a filter. And I wish I could say his name because he was an amazing filter. You know, he just, <laughs> he just did such great work. He eventually yeah. became a full director. And when he did, I was just like, I can see why. Yeah. Because working with you was amazing. And I could always, he always valued the contrib contribution we'd made, but helped us push it further. 
And, mm -hmm. uh, and sometimes he'd say, Hey, this is what it should look like. And he'd act, he'd say, get out your phone and he'd act it out, yep. you know? And, and it was just, it was, it was wonderful to, to have somebody who really understood uh, us as artists and also really understood the director because yeah. the director could trust him to give him the notes and to, you know, put them through the filter. And uh, yeah, was, you know, I, yeah. Like I've seen comments come back uh, along the lines of, I see what you're going for here. The reason <laughs> I think this doesn't work and an explanation as to why I think yeah. uh, helps the artist figure out, get further into the director's head so that the next time that they do something, uh, they actually understand the, uh, you know, the, the wants of the director or whatever scene it is. So, yeah, I actually, a, a good example of that is I, back in my musical theater days, I did, I did over 35 shows. I was going to do musical theater growing up. That was, that was going to be my thing. <laughs> then I discovered animation. I was like, mm. <laughs> well, maybe I can do both <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So I remember working with this director and he actually was a really brilliant director. Um, so not to discredit him, but I, I saw an interaction happen where there was this actor who'd worked with that director a lot and maybe was overstepping his bounds a little bit. And so the director put him in, in the place and said, no, no, I have this overall vision. Uh, and so you're wrong, I'm right. <laughs> and it was just like, it was the only bad moment I ever saw this director have, but I bookmarked it in my brain. I thought, I, I, w I hope that I can handle that differently. That I can say, yeah. okay, this is the reason for, for what I, like this is what I'm trying to figure out right now. This is a great idea independently. We're, we need to find something that fits. And, and then, you know, then maybe it can become more of a collaboration rather than a power struggle, if that makes sense. Yes, that would be an excellent way to handle it, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, and, and, and too, with the, I mean, also the directors are also young. So I think. Right, yeah, yeah. Well, which is why, like, <laughs> okay, uh, I, I give that disclaimer. He was an amazing director. Right. Like, this was the only moment of that whole show, production working with him, that I saw that moment. And uh, so. They may, have, they may have just come out of a budget meeting. <laughs> or something like that. Well, it's a musical theater thing, so they didn't have very many budget meetings. Oh, okay. But um, <laughs> like they had, they already had their budget divided and everything. But um, yeah, so but I did think of something interesting. So kind of an idea that I've had, and I wonder what you would think of this. I actually would really love, but I could see this possibly getting out of hand if you didn't have the right things in place. But I would really love. If I'm working on a production, especially if it's a remote production, it would be wonderful to have like office hours, like every Friday at 12 to 2. If you want to come and talk to me about like how, what your experience is on the show in, in a way that I can better understand how to give you better notes and that sort of thing, let's have office hours. What, what do you think of that? I think it's a great idea. I mean, it, open door policies are, are, are a very good idea. I like the idea of, of it being scheduled because you also have work to, to get. Done. Yes. So, <laughs> so, yes. Uh, you know, booking off some time when, when people can actually interact uh, as freely as they, as they want with you. With you. I think that's a great. idea. Yeah. yeah. And I think it comes from the premise of like, I'm giving a note that this person, I don't even really interact with them often. It would be nice to know how, how the way I say things, the way I do things impacts mm -hmm. them. And uh, yeah, no, that's a good idea. Yeah, great. <laughs> awesome. It's the first time I've really run that past anybody that I can remember on the show. Maybe I've done it before. <laughs> but uh, I mean, any, anything that furthers communication, anything that uh, I think helps connect uh, you with the artist or the artist with the director, so I, it can't be a bad thing. Right. Because the principle of communication is, like, I'm not just a good communicator because I think I'm a good communicator. I know I'm a good communicator when I find out what happened when that message re reached the other person, yeah. right? <laughs> Yeah. Which is much easier when you're like, like we are. And sorry that I'm not looking at the camera. I'm actually looking down at Jeff. <laughs> Usually I have a teleprompter up. But uh, I think it's more important to be looking at you, Jeff, and just seeing like, okay, when I say that, oh, he smiles. When I say that, oh, he looks a little bit uncomfortable. So what, what was going on there, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and that's a wonderful thing to be able to do is to assess the quality of the message that I'm sending. So I mean, I, I mean, obviously, sometimes you can see it in uh, what the animators or the, the artists produce on screen as well. But uh, that direct that's true, especially, you know, uh, yeah. just sort of going back to your idea of having that open door as the director. Uh, I mean, some of these shows, um, you know, our feature films aren't as big as some of them that are out there, but we still yeah. have 150 to 200 people working on it. That's right. a lot of people. So that, that there may actually be some people on the show that you barely meet. So, yeah. um, 
you know, they, they, they may look forward to actually being able to interact with you and, and sort of get a, a feel for what you're, uh, what you're looking for. Uh, all hands would be another good one. You know, um, Jorge loves to do those, uh, to speak to the whole crew, uh, every occasionally so that, uh, you know, he can sort of present his message directly to the whole crew all at once. Uh, those have been highly effective as well. Yes. Yes. I've seen that. I love those. It's just, it's awesome to be able to, to hear the director, like to be in the room with the director in the screening room and to start to get like a pulse on his thoughts. is just so valuable. Um, I also thought we, remotely, there could be some meetings that we just record that are just available and they just live there. Like if you're an art director, here's the videos that we had that we thought, okay, we need to cut these out of these meetings and make sure that they're shared with the rest of the team. Yeah. I think we, that would we be do that. So we internally, we do that with a lot of our uh, meetings so that the team, uh, let's say there is a review and the animators can't be there for that particular review. Uh, yeah. They will actually get that uh, that review material. And so again, it's literally straight from the director's uh, mouth, even if they weren't there. That's brilliant. That's awesome. Well, we're about to the end of the show. Um, I always ask people about the Get Wiser moment, uh, part of the brand. Uh, mm -hmm. My goal as I'm making films is to get the deepest potency of truth into a film. And uh, I always ask my guests, what approach would you recommend if that's my number one goal as a storyteller? Uh, try running it past your mother to see what she thinks. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't gotten that answer before. Explain that. <laughs> well, I, you know, uh, you know, I, I think I, I think welcoming uh, uh, honest critique, not just from your peers, but also people that may end up being your audience. Uh, so people that aren't uh, uh, sort of sitting there uh, 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 reading the same books that you are, watching the same movies that you are. Uh, right. I think, I think that's hyper, hyper important to, to sort of try and connect with uh, uh, your eventual end audience. So yeah, yeah look, looking for a, a variety of opinions on, on the work that you're doing would be. Yeah would be a strong thing to do. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, on this, these five pitches that I'm putting together, I, I work in a building with a bunch, of, a bunch of entrepreneurs and they all have different businesses and they're mm -hmm. all very, very different from my business. And it's, it's been one of the most amazing experiences ever. And, and I asked them if they would want to read these five pitches and give me feedback on them. Like one, of, one each would grab it and we'd have like a little meeting, like a little round table and kind of discuss them. And one of the guys, he's, he's a business consultant. He's like, are you sure that we're the right target audience? <laughs> and my answer to that was like, you're an opinion. Yeah. You know, just hearing an opinion is, is just a great thing. Well, and an and, and, and opinion, again, that isn't uh, sort of, uh, you know, sometimes we get blinders on in this industry too. Right. So, so yeah. hearing a, a, a completely different opinion from somebody that doesn't live what we live all the time, I think is an important thing, for sure. Well, awesome. That was a great, uh, a great answer to the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. And uh, is there anything else you'd want to talk about before we have just like two minutes left? Uh, just, you know, just check out tangentlabs.com. Take a look at Loop. If you're, uh, you know, if you're uh, an as uh, aspiring director uh, or you're an artist that wants to collaborate with uh, other artists, we literally have like really, really affordable packages to get you started and basically give you an infrastructure like a large studio and allow you to progress all the way up to a larger state. So uh, that's basically the only thing I, I, I want to put across. Uh, and also, you know, good luck going forward. Uh, so looking forward to see where, where uh, your story goes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And good luck to my audience. We have a lot of people who are aspiring filmmakers that watch this show and For listen sure. to this show. So yeah, yeah. It's it's fun to meet all of you. If, if you want to reach out to me, you can. Uh, the best way to follow my email list is scottweiser.com slash follow. You can follow me on Instagram. And, and I'm actually the most active on LinkedIn these days. And uh, if you want to follow Jeff Bell and Tangent Animation, I have put the links down in the, the description for that. Uh, on both the audio version, we actually have a podcast version of this that my intern ed edits. Actually, she's not, she's not my intern anymore, technically, but she's now my employee. But uh, yeah, thank you so much for being on Thanks the show, for Jeff. And thank you very much for having me, Scott. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. And until, until next time, I hope we all get a little wiser. You have been watching the Directing Animation Livecast with Scott Weiser. Audio version edited by Kiera Horowitz. Copyright Scott Weiser, LLC 2020.